Well, Fred, welcome to Uncut and Real Raw. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, it's been a pleasure. I've been wanting you on the show for a long time. This podcast is about talking to people that have come from nothing, made great successes of their life, and more than anything, uh, we want to tell life stories about people's successes, people's kind of fuck-ups, what you could do different, you know, and then we all learn from it. The podcast is picking up a lot of popularity because of the realness that we're keeping it. So with that being said, I, I wanted to talk to you honestly, especially, I like interviewing people especially in industries that I don't know a lot about. I'm not from the rodeo world, okay? Yeah. And so I love learning about anything new about somebody's career. But the one thing I've noticed about all champions in and out of the arena is they have fucking passion. They got something that average people don't have. And when you really look, look at it, what it is, it's more try than everybody else. It's more passion than everybody else. So that's the one common thing I've noticed. But I really want to dig into your life and, and ask you about your whole career from start to finish, to be honest with you. I got you. Good deal. And that's the one thing that, that I was really, really just so in. I've heard it said before. I mean, in, in order to be great at something, you almost have to be about half a uh, lunatic. You do. You know? Yes. You, there's something about you that has to wake up every day and just crave it no matter what. You you do it at all costs. Yep. And there is a cost, isn't there? You're damn right there's a cost. I, I said that on the gauge a few years ago when I did that gauge podcast. I said, there is a cost to success. It's usually your families. It's usually your friends. It's usually your kids. Because you have to be fucking obsessed, don't you, Fred? Like, you go to bed thinking about it. You wake up. And, and to a fault, even today, because I teach a lot of kids. Yeah. And then I, I help a lot of kids. And mm -hmm. I've got some young horses that I'm riding. And my biggest flaw is I still want it more than the actual person that I'm helping. And that's frustrating, isn't it? It's really frustrating because every once in a while I've got to pull myself back mm -hmm. and say, hey, yes, this is a 15-year-old kid. This is a 12-year-old kid. <laughs> they're, they're not you. Yeah. No, they didn't come from a broken home. Yeah. They didn't come from a dad that walked out and a yeah. mom that worked her ass off yeah. for me to be able to do the things that I've done. And so... Um, you know, I, I cherished every moment that I got to run a calf, and I would go over, you know, from third, fourth grade after school, and I'd turn out calves all night long just in hopes to get to get on a horse and chase one. Yeah. So, so by the time I got 15, 16 years old, there was an animal built up inside of me that that's all I wanted to do no matter what. And I love that word because it, it kind of is like you're an animal, isn't yeah. it? You're kind of fucking borderline crazy, aren't you? Most definitely. Yes. It, 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 yes. People don't get that. To be number one at anything, it's got to just consume you. Would you agree? Yes, sir. And in the moment, you don't realize it. Yeah. You know, you touched on it a few minutes ago. I've neglected my wife. Mm -hmm. I've neglected my girls. Yep. But it was all for the prize yes. that I was seeking and, and most of the time, if you don't have that, and most people aren't going to be honest and tell you that yeah, until after true. the fact. Yes. And, you know, I, no matter what it took, yeah, I, I was just doing it. I was crazy. Yeah. You know, I, I drove all night. You know, people had drivers and shit back then. Mm -hmm. I, I would drive all night. I would pay a guy to go with me, mm. but I wouldn't let him drive. Mm -hmm. I said, you're not driving. All you do is take care of the horses when we get to where we're going. Mm. Hell, I would tie one at seven and jump in the truck and drive 900 miles mm. to run another one the next morning. Yeah. And I would bounce out and do it like it wasn't shit. But yeah. then when I laid down, I was just mentally exhausted, yeah. drained the whole nine yards. And his job was just to take care, care of, of those horses. Make damn sure that they had water, feed, and was taken care of no matter where we were. Comfortable. Yeah. Yes, sir. Well, we're going to dive into that, mate. But I'm I, I really glad you said about that because they're just... When, you are right. When you're in the middle of your career, and and even though I was a clinician, I wasn't a competitor. It was you're still an animal. You you know you you when you're in the you are right. When you're in the middle of it, you don't know the damage you cause no. to the people around you. Sometimes we're lucky enough to have close friends that we respect. I remember it, uh, specifically one of my closest friends and and mentor, still a mentor to me, Ken Bray, came to me in Equibrand. In my, and when I was really just insane, the amount of clinics I was doing, living on the road, and he came to me and he said, you're gonna hurt yourself soon. You just, you, you know, there's a three-legged chair and every leg is important. If one of those legs comes off it, 
you fall on your ass. Yeah. And he said, I'm coming to you to tell you, you can't see it, but you're about to fucking go off a cliff. And I had enough, I couldn't exactly understand what he was saying, but I had enough respect that when he spoke, you listened. He didn't say a lot, but when he did, you fucking paid attention. So when he calls me and says, pull back the reins, it's time to pull back the reins, yes. you know? And I think when you get outside your career, would you agree with this? Or when I say outside of it, kind of semi-retire or, or get out of that, that grind, I think that's when you start realizing, God damn, some of the shit I did was fucking stupid and crazy. Yeah. Would you agree with that or not? Sure, 100%. And I mean, like you, you're mentioning Ken, I had Stephen Perry, I had Howard Rogers, I had Cedric Haynes, mm -hmm. I had Tom Epperson, mm -hmm. there was Roy Moffat. I mean, I could go down the list. There's five, six, seven, eight guys mm. that I confided in mm. all the time. Guys that watched me grow up, mm. watched my career take off. And whenever I was having problems, whether it be horse problems, whether it was inside the arena problems, or whether it was women problem. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You know, I, I could always call those guys up and they they would say, you know, it was one of the, the five or six or seven mm. because my father wasn't around and yeah. I would say, Hey man, I need your advice with this. Yes. And said, Fred, this is what I this is what I would do. Yeah. I don't want to make that decision for you, but this is my advice to yes. you. Yes. And, and so, um And that's where don't you agree? That's where it's really important that a man has a, a, a group of people around him that, that are not what I call yes men. Yeah. They're not there to kiss your ass. Yes. They're, they're there to tell you the fucking truth. So when you need your ass whipped, they'll whip your ass. When they need to pat you on the back and say, hell of a job, you did a hell of a job, they, those friends are worth a million dollars and they're few and far between because when you get kind of famous and you're, you're at the height of your career, you get a lot of yes men around you. Yes men, yes women, and they're not necessarily healthy. They're just telling you what you want to hear exactly. would you agree with that yes sir 100 percent. and and the deal was is that any of those five six seven whatever the number mm -hmm. eight guys it's usually low they they yeah. were always going to tell you yeah the truth yes the truth no no whether you wanted to hear it or not it was important you wanted to hear it or not yes and and that's one of the most yeah. integral parts of my entire career yeah. you know is is having guys that were damn sure straight up and mm -hmm. honest with me, no matter how bad it hurt, or mm -hmm. no matter how bad I didn't want to hear it. Hear it, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? And well, so, let, sorry, keep going. No, that was just one of one of the, the parts of my life that, that really helped me stay on the straight and narrow because Clinton, I could have went either way. Oh, yeah. You know, I yeah. I was around a couple of guys that, that had drug problems. Mm -hmm. You know, I experimented with it. Yep. Never really talked about yep. it, but... I experimented with it. Mm -hmm. I knew it was a dead end street. Yep. I knew it wasn't right. Yeah. And yeah. I knew that if my black ass ever got caught, yeah. that yeah. I was going to be stuck in jail. Yeah. Well, let's let's back up a little bit here. Um, you know, uh, what I know about you is you're just a champion. That's about it. And I want to know all the details because there's a lot that goes into becoming a champion. Everybody just sees the final five seconds. And, the, you know, they see you on tour or they see you at the NFR. That's just the last little bit of the grind. You know what I mean? There was a whole, there was a whole, sh whole journey of shit that wasn't very much fun, uh, uh, pretty stressful mentally and physically to get to that point. Let's back up a little bit. Uh, first of all, how old are you, Fred? I'm 56 years 56, old. 56, I'm 48. Where were you born and raised, mate? Born and raised in Cypress, Texas. Cypress, Texas. Just to the northwest of Houston. Okay. Uh, you come from a horse family, not a horse family. Tell me a little bit about growing up, what went on there. So, long story short. Yeah, that's right. I, my mom worked for gas and oil company. It's Moffitt, Moffitt Oil Company yep. at the time now. It's Moffitt Services. And so their son had horses and roped and rodeoed and stuff. And we're six, seven years apart in age. And so he was already in school right before I started school. Right. So every day after work, and my mom worked, she worked in the office, she cleaned the house, done it all. So we just lived like 300 yards apart. So every day I'd get off the bus and I would go over there. And I mentioned that earlier that I'd go over and turn out calves. Mm -hmm. His family was actually going to Ari and Martha Josie. This was early 70s. Oh, truly. And they were buying horses. Yeah, he had, hell, we had 150 head of calves over there and he had eight to ten horses, and the dad was a DEA agent. Okay. And so he, he actually... So how old was your buddy, the son? How old were he? We, so... With 10, 11, what? Yeah, he's 11, 12 years old. Okay. So you're going there after school just thinking this is cool. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, just just playing around yeah. with it. And I mean, hell, I think his dad passed away in seventy five or six. And so then it was just his mother and him and his older brother. Mm -hmm. And so I mean, we spent we spent a lot of time together and it just when my mom moved away to Houston, uh probably sixth grade, mm -hmm. then I stayed with his family because I didn't want to go to Houston. Yeah. Yeah. So I just I would stay over there with my grandpa because he lived across the street. OK. And then just back and forth. And hell, before you know it, I was just living with just him. part of family, part of yeah. the family. Yeah. Yes, sir. So what made that? What was your buddy's name? Your friend? Roy. Roy. What had what gave him a passion for the calf rope? And any you know what I mean? Where did he get that from? His he, dad or? No, his dad never rodeoed, but his dad was always around uh, Barry Burke. Mm -hmm. You know, being a DEA agent, yep. I don't know how their relationship yep. formed, but uh, him and Roy Duvall mm -hmm. were good friends. Right. And so whenever they come to Rodeo Houston, they would stay around there. Yeah. So Roy got involved in, in the sport of calf roping, and yeah. that's how I got introduced. So to quite him. quite honestly, if he could, if he was a, a, a team rope or a barrel racer, you could have gone a different direction. Theoretically, you got you were just exposed to what was there. Yes, sir. And you took a bug for it, you know. Sure. But theoretically, it could have been another sport. If he was into cow horses, it could have been cow horses. Sure. It could have been rainers. It could have been anything, theoretically. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember as a little kid, Fred, uh, having um, – just kind of a passion for the horses or interest in them? Did they scare you as a little kid? Did you, did, did, uh, what I'm trying to ask is this. I always tell, I always believe this. You either got the fucking horse bug or you don't. And you don't have to be raised by a horse family to have it, but kids can go down the road and look out a window and live in the city and see a horse and their whole life they just want to get a horse. That's all they've ever wanted. It's just in them. Yep. You don't know why it's in them. The parents don't have it. They're not exposed to it. But they've either got that bug for the horse and they, or they don't. And it's kind of like a drug. It never leaves you. Right. You might try to get rid of it every once in a while, but you keep coming back from it. Do you think you had that as a little kid? Well, my grandpa... Screwed up one Christmas, I believe, and mm -hmm. got us, me and my brother, Shetland ponies. Okay. So that's where it real started there. Yes. We got to riding them, and we thought we couldn't afford the saddles. So nah. we just rode them bareback. Yeah, yeah. One summer, they had all the hair rubbed <laughs> off their back. Our little ass has been sitting. <laughs> Seriously. I don't blame you. I don't blame you. And we would ride them to the 7-Eleven. We'd ride them to the little tavern up there where everybody was and just tie the sun bitch up tie yeah. him up and when it got dark we was rode him home burning it getting and looking back on it i bet they were the, some of the broken some bitches in the world oh, they just stay tied up so, yeah so we could rope on them yeah yeah didn't have a saddle so we put a little neck rope around their neck and everybody's like you're gonna break them little son bitches neck and i said no because <laughs> they would stop and brace up and then we would get off and go down there and tie the damn calf down and we done taught these horses how to back up and work the rope, and people were just flabbergasted by what they would see. <laughs> you know, we were like a little sideshow when everybody showed up over there, and he'd say, hey, go run one. That's awesome. And then the next thing you know, we'd get on a big horse and, and go out there and stick it on one, and they'd be like, oh, shit. <laughs> There's something brewing here. You know what's so, funny about those Shetlands? If you had those little son of bitches today, you'd get some money for that. Oh my! Seriously, you know what I mean? You you have a kid that could go do what you were just talking about there. That thing would bring some money. Lots. Yeah, lots of money. Okay, so you kind of got the bug there. Uh, you finished high school. You didn't finish high. Are you high school rodeo? And who who's kind of getting you more into the sport? I went for just a little bit, and this is this is crazy right here. So. I didn't actually own a horse. Mm -hmm. I was borrowing Roy's horses, and there was another buddy of mine, Damon McVeigh. Mm -hmm. And so we both rode the same horse one year at the mm -hmm. rodeos. Come finals time, they stuck in a rule that you couldn't ride the same horse. Okay. So then I said, that's all right. We'll mm -hmm. be fine. I'll, yeah. I'll, we'll figure it out. And then the next year at the high school rodeos, so I was part of the no pass, no play deal. I don't know what that means, mate. Really? Yeah, seriously. I, I don't know what that means. Well, first of all, they said I wasn't going to school. So they made me bring a report card. Then the second... What's it called? No pass, no play? No pass, no play. And it's for kids in school? Yes. I, I, I don't mean to be ignorant, but I don't know what it means. No, no, no. no. I'll, I'll explain it to yeah. you. So first of all, they said I wasn't going to school. The school board said this. The no, school district. The association. The high school road oh, okay. association. Oh, okay. So they were they were just pissed off because I didn't own nothing and I was sticking it on all the little rich kids. Oh, okay, that's where it was coming from. Yes, sir. okay. I'm trying to think why they busting your balls. So then, because <laughs> I would show up somewhere, no horse, no nothing. I'd just show up and. And you're 13, 14. How old are you? No, I'm 15. 15 by now. Yeah, right. freshman. And so 
eight flat would be winning the roping. Yep. Or I'm sorry, twelve flat, and I would be like eight flat. Okay, so you're not just beating them a little bit; you're whipping yeah, their eyes. It's 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 getting yeah to the point they can't stand it. So then they said, "Well, he's going to school. We can't get him on that. So he's not passing." So then, meaning you're not passing your grades. Yes. Okay. So then I had to start taking a report card to to the high school rodeos, and I said, "You know what?" I said, I'm just about done with this bullshit anyway. I mm -hmm. said, because, and, and not to say nothing mean towards mm -hmm. anybody, I said, 90% of you some bitches ain't going where I'm going anyway. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm going to let y'all have it, and then that way I don't have the headache of. I left high school at 15. I'm not book smart, I'm not educated, never went to fucking college, but I sure had a run at it. Oh, yeah. You get what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. So I, when you just made that comment, you motherfuckers aren't going where I'm going, I know exactly what that means. Yeah. Because... Champions and winners, they know from an early age where they're going. They don't exactly know how to get there. They don't exactly know what path to take, but they know they're going somewhere. Yeah. I knew I was going to be number one at what I did. I didn't know how long it'd take. I didn't know exactly the journey of it, but something inside you knows. And when you said that, that means something, doesn't it? So at that point, 15, did you go pro or what happens now? No, 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 no. This is a process, man. I went... I went to... So you're 15, kind of build from there. 15 years old, I started going to a bunch of amateur rodeos and jackpots, and I showed up at Giddings one afternoon, and it had the Roy Coopers, the Barry Burks, mm -hmm. the D. Pickett's, I mean, you name them. The, the big Daniel guns. Daniels, yeah. And hell, I'm 16 years old. This would have been 84, probably. Mm -hmm. Now, are you training your own horses by this stage? You're borrowing horses I'm still? Riding, I'm riding all the Roy's. Roy's got okay. some R.E. Josie rejects, and we've done bought a few more. And I mean, I'd been building, you know. Everybody'd yep. been saying, hey, that dude right there, you know. You two are practicing every day, every day after school. Yes, you two are tight. Sir, that's okay. All, that's and you're kind of, and, and you're younger than him, but you'll you'll keep up with him, or you're better than him, or you know, as far as the roping goes, are we're, you we're, 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 neck we're, and we're neck? neck? We're approaching the stage where I'm getting to be a little bit better yes, than what he. Yes, but he's be. passionate too. Yes, I'm just. You got a and, teammate there, and, correct? And, and here's the deal, man. We would go to jackpots every once in a while somewhere. If if we didn't have enough money for both of us to rope, guess who got to rope? We we done entered that stage mm -hmm. of, of of my roping. Where he'd say, hell, you just rope. I know you're going to win something. Yeah. It'll be good. Yeah. And yeah. so that's how I kind of basically got started, man. And I would go, I went to that jackpot there that day. And I mean, all the, the top guys in the world was there. And I think Roy Cooper, we won first and second in the first round. And, you know, it was his heyday. He was mm. the guy that day. Mm -hmm. So we would just we just wanted to be around them. You yeah, know what I mean, they were idols. Exactly. So how receptive were they? Meaning that, where, well, let's just say it because because I had a lot of idols too, and I looked up to them, and I'd watch them. I was like a creeper. I just sit on the fence and watch them practice, and I just wanted to study them and see what they did. I was passionate about trying to figure out why they were better than everybody else. Did you have that same passion to watch them? No, no doubt. I mean, I, I sit and I studied them and. And, and just watch those guys. And when I got opportunity to, to watch them rope, I would be just like, you know, you would marvel. Yes. Because you weren't at that plateau, mm -hmm. but you're working and building yeah. towards what the, okay. those guys are doing, yep. you know, and right in front of you. I don't, again, my ignorance is probably a good thing for this because I'm going to ask you questions that most people may want to ask is, at least in the Western performance world and the reining, cutting and cow horse industries, People are very willing to share information, especially with kids or younger people coming up. Even me being a clinician, and now I'm starting to be a competitor. You know, I'm going from one industry to another. Mm -hmm. They're very willing to share information, welcome you, mentor you. Is the rodeo world like that or not really? Is everybody keep their secrets to themselves a little bit? Or back in that day, is it different from today? I, I think it's it was different back then than okay. it is today, okay. honestly. Because in, in my heyday, I'm not going to sit here and bullshit you. Yeah, no, I don't want you to. I wasn't trying to help somebody else beat me. Fair enough. If we were rodeoing together, yep. then then you're in the circle. Yes, okay. If you're outside the circle, you know, genuine, hey, how you doing? Yes. How's it going? Yeah. And move right along. Fair you know, enough. Somebody come up and ask me something, I'm not going to yes. outright tell them a lie. Yes. It's just a little bit more vague than what it should be. No problem. I just want to know what the culture yeah. was like back that, then. That, that's my honest opinion. Yes. And analogy of it, but... Uh, today's competitors, they're they're way different than 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 the generation I grew up. What's different you know, about I mean, them? 
coming. They'll tell you something standing right here, and as soon as they walk out that door, it changed. Oh, truly? Yeah. Truly. So they'll try and trick you a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. Okay. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. But, I mean, it's just smart business. Hell, and and look at today's, the, the dollars that they're running at today. Mm, mm, mm. I mean, I was just out there at the NFR with Shad Mayfield. He had a chance to win 240000 Yeah. You yeah, know what I'm money. saying? Yeah. And, and so, for me, uh, my personal opinion, mm -hmm. this is nothing on him, yeah. but – why am I going to help somebody beat me mm -hmm. at what I'm trying to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, you got to work your ass off just like I did. Yes. yes. That, that's my. Yes. Fair enough. Negative. Fair enough. I mean, fair enough. So at this rope and you want, you win the rope and all your. Uh, I won second. Second. I okay. Sorry. It. Yeah. And I won hell back then $5,000. That was a big chunk yeah, of change. I'm right. And I thought there'd never be another poor date. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously. I love it. And then I started showing up at a lot of the jackpots, man. And it, I mean, it was just win after win after win. And I thought this shit is easy. You know what I mean? Okay. Do you think it came a little too easy looking back no, on it? No, no, no. Because I, I'd worked my ass off, man, honestly. Yes. I mean, I, yes. That's all I did. And hell, my senior year, I'd get out of school at 11 o'clock and I would go home and I'd move away from Roy's at this time and I'd go to Butos and hell I'd run 200 calves a day. The reason I asked that question is two nights ago I had J.D. Yates sitting there yeah, and he had a great story and one of the reason I asked did it come too easy is J.D. had a great story and he said his first year at the NFR he was 14 yeah. and he kicked ass yeah. and then for the next two years he said I sucked. He said I went from way up here I'm a glory guy you know first year at the NFR I'm, I'm kicking ass and he said for the next two years I couldn't rope to, to save my life and and he said looking back on it he said I it came so easy the first year I thought this was easy and he said then I had the crash and then come back up again and he did get out of his funk but that's why I just asked that question is is did it did, did sometimes when the success comes quick there's always a valley after it well and, and I'll say this like so so fast forward a few years later you know i I get my pro card mm -hmm. would have been. Uh, well, just just back up just one second because I, I want to get a good history here. So, when you get second at this rodeo, how old are you now? Sixteen. Sixteen. You're yeah. still in school at this point, or not? Yeah. Okay, yeah. still in school. Okay, and um, uh, where? How are we moving on from there? Like this kind of going well, succession. So you and Roy just keep going. No, we just keep working and and you know somewhere along in there there was some disagreements and stuff. Mm -hmm. and I decided that. It may be time to, to yep. kind of branch out yep. a little bit. I understand. So, I understand. That's life. So who's who's coaching you two? Are you two coaching each other, just, or just figuring it out? It's me and him. Yeah. Okay. Him and I mean, you don't have a coach. You don't have anybody out there watching you. You just, you're just two guys hitting even it. And, uh, you know, just some local guys, yeah. future guys. And yeah. So my my passion is 100 percent what got me to the next level. Yes. And I mean, I never had no. I mean, there was Ronnie Seawalt, which he made the NFR, God, I don't even know how many times, 15, 16, mm -hmm. was a reserve world champion. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. He lived about 12, 13 miles from us. I mean, that was as close mm. as we got to a guy that was actually in the trenches and there. Doing it. Yeah. And so Rusty and I were good friends, and then Ricky Canton, mm -hmm. who went to, gosh, I don't know, he made several NFRs himself, and so... That was the time we kind of all three grew up around each other. Okay. And so we would go to youth rodeos and we mm -hmm. would travel together to amateur rodeos and stuff. And so, uh, other other than 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 like a straight up coach, no, no, no okay. never, never. Happened. So when did you decide to leave high school? Then what did you go to college or what happened? No, then? no college. I, I, you know, I was supposed to, and I told my mom. I said, listen, I said I'm not college material. Mm -hmm. Let's don't waste our money. We yeah. really can't afford it. We're going to be throwing money away. But so. So back up to your mother just to sit a little bit. Is she supporting you in this rodeo world? As much as, as she, much as she can. She don't really come from that world, but she's not against it. No. She's not telling you, Fred, this is a waste of time. You need to go to college. Like, she's not knocking it, I suppose, is what we I'm asking. Go to, we would go to the black rodeos on Sunday, pay my entry fees. I'd win money. We'd split it. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. So she was supportive for, as best she could not being from that world, correct? At 100%. Hmm. Not a doubt. And so then uh, I, I moved away. I took a job. This would be my How old are you year. now? 17, 18. Okay. Senior year. Buto come to me one summer, uh, Bill, 
And he said, listen, young man, he said, I've been watching you for about a year. Mm -hmm. He said, you're really talented. And he said, I'm buying a bunch of horses. I want you to come live with me. He said, I'll give you a pickup truck. I'll pay you this much a week. I'll give you a place to live. So I went to my mom, talked to her. Roy said, whatever you want to do, I don't really give a shit, but I don't like it. Mm -hmm. And so I just packed up and I yep. moved off to Conroe over there and I go to training horses and hell he's got, I think we started out with about 50. Mm -hmm. By the end of the summer, he's got 200. So a lot. Uh -oh. So too many, but more than you can handle. Oh, yeah. it was ridiculous. Are you enjoying, let's, we haven't touched on this, but I want to ask about it. Are you enjoying the actual horse training part? Do you enjoy training horses, Fred, or did you? I did until I went through with what I went through with this guy. Okay. Well, what, it was okay. it was just a pass through deal. Mm -hmm. He would go buy a trailer load of three year olds from Dick's Turnbow, mm -hmm. uh, Marvin Cantrell. They all traded horses. They all come through there. So you weren't necessarily taking them from the beginning to the end. You were just trying to make them better and flip them. Yeah. Okay. Most, most so you rodeoing them during this time too, or not? That's hold on. Okay. Now that that all once I got over there. And he got his little little arms around yeah, and yeah. got me to buy into all this mm -hmm. shit. And then all of a sudden the rodeo and stopped. And that's that's so, where it's where it's a problem so, for you. Yeah. You damn right. Yeah. That's where you know the the first year I was over there, I stayed there about a year and a half. And yeah. you know I had me a bunch of money saved up. I was winning a little bit here and there, and had a pretty good little nest egg for when I was going to start rodeo in the mm. following year. And so. He actually started putting parameters. Mm. Can't do this. Can't go here. You wouldn't be nothing without me. Oh, yeah. Fucking with your head. Yeah. yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Ever wanted to own a champion? Clinton Anderson, world-class horse trainer and competitor, has been spotting and developing promising horses into greatness for decades. Now... He is offering an exclusive ownership opportunity to create champion horses. Introducing Clinton Anderson's Performance Partnership. In this exclusive program, you and Clinton will co-own a top-tier performance horse that will be meticulously trained and cared for by Clinton Anderson himself. This isn't just an investment. It's a first-hand experience of horsemanship excellence. With Clinton's help and advice, you'll choose the horse that resonates with your ambitions, and Clinton takes the reins from there. From training to stabling, from the practice arena to the winner's circle, Clinton's unwavering dedication ensures that your equine athlete reaches its full potential. This partnership is about more than business. It's about a shared passion for equestrian excellence. And Clinton Anderson isn't just your trainer, he's your partner fully invested in every horse's success. Together, you'll share in the excitement, the prestige, and the profits. Membership is strictly limited to ensure each investor receives personalized attention and commitment. It's your chance to be part of an exclusive equine ownership community that combines the excitement of competition with the satisfaction of success. Don't miss your opportunity to join Clinton Anderson's Performance Partnership, a unique collaboration that transforms dreams into equine champions. Experience the heart of horsemanship excellence. Find out more at ClintonAndersonPerformanceHorses.com. think Roy, even though so Roy said he didn't like you going, do you think he had an intu intuition that this is a fucked up deal or would you just think he just didn't like it? You know what I'm trying to say? Do you think Do you think he genuinely thought this is not good? Because some deals are too good to be true. I, I think deep down he didn't like the situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, he wanted what was best for me, but deep down he felt like, yeah. you know, some things could go awry. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, Sometimes you have a sixth sense that things aren't quite as what they used to. I, I rem like the first two years I worked for, uh, got out of high school, you know, I left high school at 15. The first two years I worked for Gordon McKinley, I worked for free. He just gave me a room to sleep in, yeah. an old caravan, food on the table, and I got to train horses. I thought I was the luckiest kid in the world, that I got to train horses all day, every day, seven days a week. And after a couple of years, I got pretty handy at starting colts and problem horses. And one time I had this guy walk up to me and, 
And he said, uh, you know, uh, hey, what's Gordon paying you? And I'm just kind of a little bit naive. I was naive and in some ways ahead of my age. And I said, oh, he doesn't pay me anything. I just ride horses all, you know, train horses for him all day. And he said, oh, my God, that's terrible. I can't believe he doesn't pay you. You know, if you come to me and I'll, I've got, I'll pay you to start all these 20 cults and you come to my place and you have a place to live and you should be getting paid and basically stirring the pot. Oh, yeah. And for something in my gut just looked at me and just said to myself, I just thought to myself, and what happens once I start these 20 cults and I fucking burn this bridge over here with my mentor, you're going to fucking get rid of me. Yeah. And something in my gut just told me this is way too good to be true and I'm about to get a fucking. And I said, well, I sure appreciate that, sir, but I sure like staying with Gordon and I, and you know, he might not be paying me in cash, but he's paying me in knowledge. Yeah. He's paying me in experience. He's paying me in life. And I was smart enough not to just take that cherry that was over there a little yeah. bit. You get what I'm trying to say? Oh, yeah. You know. Most times, if, most times, even as an adult now, Fred, would you agree if the fucking deal sounds too good to be true, it probably is. It's too good to be true. <laughs> so after a year and a half, what happens? So after a year and a half, I... I You're probably 19 now? Yes, sir. Yep. I take off to the NARC finals in El Paso, Texas, and I went with a guy, Tommy Belusic. Took one of Bill's horses, and we're going to be going a week and a half. I'd qualified through the TRA, Texas Rodeo Association. Okay. So it's a good paying deal, going to be out there four or five days, and we got out there, got to act stupid, blew the engine up in his truck. Okay. So we're gone for like two weeks. Mm -hmm. By the time we get a new engine put in his truck and get back home, we'll... <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this guy, in uh, bless his heart, he just passed away. He was sitting on the fence when I showed back up over there at Butos and Conroe, and he said, uh, "He says, God damn boy, where you been?" <laughs> I said, "Well, I've been gone." He said, "I've been waiting on the fence here for a week to try this horse." I said, "You should have got up and walked around. I bet that board fence got a little hard, didn't it?" <laughs> Wrong thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Bill, that night at dinner, he says, I tell you what, he said, next time you fucking talk to one of my customers like that, it'll be the last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just pushed my plate to the middle of the table, and I got up and went upstairs, and he come up there barking some stuff in my ear, and he said, I tell you what, if you start fucking running now, you'll run the rest of your life. Right, yeah. I just kept packing my shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it all in. I went downstairs. Got my little mare out of the stall, hooked up to my one-horse trailer, me and my raggedy-ass three-quarter-ton truck. Yeah, one-horse trailer. Threw all that shit in there, and I left driving. Mm -hmm. I drove north to Huntsville a little ways, and I called that Joe Beaver. Mm -hmm. I said, hey, man, I need a place to stay tonight, and I just left Bill's. Mm. Said, so you and Joe buddies? Are you competitors? What are you? No, he kind of knew who I was. You, right. know, I'd been, you don't know him real well. i have been seeing him around a little bit, mm -hmm. and so I stopped in there, which... Good and bad. Yeah, you yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I understand. I, I stayed there about six months until I got tired of doing what I was doing over there. Yep. You know, we roped every damn day, and that's all I did. And I, I bought a permit, but didn't have none of my shit together. You know, all the money I had saved up, I blew it, jacking with him. Okay. Were you still rodeo on during the six months oh, or not? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you winning? I was going just here and there. No, my horse was pretty green. And yep. I my head was all left up, if you want to know yeah, the truth. Yeah, that's fair enough. Fair enough. So I called Roy, and I said, hey, I said, I need a job. And I said, I want a rodeo next year. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, get your ass back down here. We'll figure it out. Yep. Back home I went, and so I stayed with my mom for a couple of weeks. And, you know, I I done got pretty headstrong. That's a, that's a good friend right there, and, that and, Roy. You, you know what I mean? Like oh, hey. a little bit of, little bit of scuffle there, a yeah. little bit of uncomfortableness, but when your ass is in a bind, yes. You call that motherfucker up, and he says, we don't have an answer, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. That's a good friend right he there, right. Would you agree? Has been, yeah. Been right. And I, I actually work for them today in outside sales. and Yeah. Uh, that, that, that's, you know, friendship, you know, you got good friends when sometimes you can have a little scuffle and then put it behind you and call up and say, hey, I got you back. When with, shit gets ugly. Without a doubt. Yes. Man, we, we talk on the phone every day. And, that's awesome. Um uh, you know, there's there's stuff that we can and can can't tell people that Yeah, I get it, but he's got you back by the sounds of it. Yes, sir. So you go back down there, what happens? Go back down there, go to work for the company. Hell I was driving a truck, maybe delivering lubes or something and mm -hmm. uh, that when you say just a company in the area. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're not you're not training horses full time by any no, no, means. No, no, hell no. What's Roy doing I for a living? Don't worry about it. He's in the field business. Okay. That's what he's done his whole life. Okay. I mean, they've got now there's about 
six parts of the company. Okay. At that time, there was one. Okay. Maybe two. Okay. There was the. Uh, there wasn't even a heavy haul division back then, but man, we're. And this is what his dad started before he passed away. His mother. His mother. Started. His mother. Okay, right. Okay. 1956. Okay. It started. Is Roy still roping part time? No, 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 no. Kind of no. giving up the rodeo. Skip the part of that. You know, his mom. She fell Christmas of '81. Mm -hmm. Broke both wrists. Mm. He had to go to work. Okay. And so it was a blessing in disguise for the both of us. Yes. Because he'd probably still be doing this shit right along with me. <laughs> he broke off his ass. Yeah, you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah, now yeah. He's worth God knows. I don't even know how many million he's worth. That's really awesome. none of my business. Yeah, but yeah. It, it is what it is. You know, he had real life hit him right in the face. And I mean, she had both had casts on her wrist up to, mm. up, I mean, casts all the way up to her wrist and couldn't bend them or nothing. Mm. And so, yeah. He, he just dropped the rope and went into the office and went to work. And I mean, it's... it's Isn't it funny? Have you noticed this in your life? And you may or may not have, but I for sure have noticed in her mind. You all go through, at different times of your life, you go through some gut-punching fuck-ups, you know, in life. People right. fuck you, betray you, business, whatever. But I, for me, at least, four or five of the shittiest moments in my life... When you're going through them, you don't understand them. You don't know why they're happening. It's shitty. It's stressful. But when you get out of it, it actually was the biggest blessing you ever had. You know what I mean? Like it turned into, I got fired from a job, which made me start down on a horsemanship. You know, it may be a millionaire by 43. You get what I'm saying? Like I, 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 I was sick to my stomach for four days I'm throwing up. But looking back on it, that was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. It, I couldn't figure it out at the time. It wasn't in the moment though. But it wasn't in the moment, but could, do you agree or disagree? Have you, do oh, you think I, I, that in life, that, that you'll go through some bad shit and you don't understand why it's happening or what, what's causing it, but once you get on the other side of the storm, it actually turned out to be a pretty handy thing to happen to you. Do you agree or disagree? Not that you have no, to agree. I, no, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Like with Roy, for example, his mother breaking his wrist basically forced him to, to be in a company and now he's worth shitloads of money, yeah. you know. But he wouldn't have done that. He would have been roping with you if it wouldn't happen. Exactly. And so fast forward to probably 2010. Mm -hmm. I want to tell this part of yeah. I know these guys can do it however they want. So I got approached by a lady to write a book. Uh -huh. You've probably heard of it. Go yep. Buckles, yes, Don't Lie. Yes, I have, yep. And so she she come out to Las Vegas. My wife and I were sitting in this fancy restaurant eating, and she slid right up there to the bar next to us. And, you know, she's this writer, and she's got all this shit going on. And, you know, I've followed your career, and I just think you're the greatest blah, 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 the biggest bunch of bullshit I've ever been yep. fed in my life. Mm -hmm. So we didn't do very much investigating, and, about two years went by, and we started writing that book and, and done a deal with her, got the contracts, got them all lined up. <clears throat> Three years later, this deal's done, finished. The book, you mean? Ready, ready, yeah. And, and we self-published. I paid for every dime of it. Mm -hmm. The only deal was is once we started recouping money, you paid me back the initial investment first. Yes. We had to... A joint bank account set up, had to have three signatures, check over mm -hmm. $5,000. Yeah. Well, one day I noticed on the debit card where she'd taken out this much and this much and this much. Mm. And I called the bank because the bank's right there in, in mm. her hometown. And I said, hey, I need you to, to stop that debit card. Mm. This mother sucker called me. You're not going to control my money. I said, hold on a minute, sweetheart. I said, this is a joint venture here. Mm -hmm. This is not a one-sided deal. Yeah. And as soon as I'm paid back every dime, then you'll start getting paid. Yeah. Okay. I tell you what, you're not going to control my fucking money, she mm -hmm. told me. And she says, I own you. Oh, truly. She's got some balls She's about it. She's done filed a joint copyright. Uh -huh. And Clinton, let me tell you something. It's the worst bullshit yeah. I've ever been in in my entire yeah. life. You hear me? Yeah. yeah. And and if it hadn't been for my wife, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be talking to you today because I was about to commit a crime. Yeah. I'm dead ass serious. Yeah. And I'm being yeah. straight up. I, I like and it. I had to sit across from this son of bitch in mediation after she done, I done paid her 150000 200000 and it took all of me yeah. not to fucking choke her to death. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you learn from that? Oh, I learned a lot. Tell me. <laughs> Cross your T's and dot your I's. Yes. Check your contracts. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. And I mean, 
I mean, here's a guy that's rodeoed his whole life, mm-hmm. you know, and, and had some pretty substantial contracts at yeah. one time with different companies. Yeah. But nothing to the magnitude of just giving 150000 away here. Oh, no. And there, 60000 here. And I mean, you talking about hurt a guy. Oh, yeah. When, when, when you do something with these hands, mm-hmm. everything that you've done yeah. and worked your ass off and paid for it, and then you got a thief oh, yeah. come in in the middle of the night and just fucking rob you, Brian. Fred, Brian. I've had a hundred. I've had one point five million dollars stolen from me from accounts. I ain't had that much. I'd and be, what I'm getting at is, up. yeah, I know what it's like to get fucking stolen from, and it's shitty. Yeah. It's real fucking shitty. It happens typically right under your nose, and that's probably one of the greatest lessons in my business career that I've had is trust nobody with your money. Open your own mail. Sign your own checks. Check your own credit card statements. I don't give a fuck how much money you're paying a CFO, how much money you're paying an accountant. Check your money and make sure they know you're checking your money. Yeah. I was too naive. I just thought if you're paying somebody a lot of money, they're not going to fucking steal from you. That's bullshit. There's some thieving motherfuckers out there. That gives and, them even and, more reason to steal and, from And you. you have to be, you basically have to act like everybody's stealing from you and you'll be fine. Yeah. If you just have the assumption that everybody around you and your money part is going to thieve from you, you'll be just fine because you'll be checking. My yeah. dumb ass is, is, was way too naive. I was way too trusting, etc. So, yes, I, even, even though there might be a few different zeros on the end of it, I understand what you're going oh, yeah. through the pain. Shit, I was... Yeah. I, I didn't know how to react, man. Yeah. I honestly didn't because, I mean, like I said, I... I and didn't set out to make millions when I wrote them. No, but that was a decent chunk of change that you and your wife could have used. I, I just wanted to tell my story mm-hmm. from my point of view. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, I understand. Yeah. So, so moving forward now, you go, you go back to Roy. You and him start kind of just driving trucks and things. Are you, are you going doing the rodeos on the weekend? What, yeah, what are you doing here? I would here? go on the weekends. I mean, I, it wasn't, it wasn't 100% priority at the time i was trying to how old are you during this period i'm just turned 20 20 okay you're not married no kids by this point nothing like that okay so how long does that phase go through you and him a driving truck about a year and a half Mm -hmm. you know and i i got back to rodeoing and did you have a bug for it you get a little antsy what yeah Yeah. i I always knew where i was going Mm -hmm. it was just just a minor setback get get a couple good horses where i could afford to to get on the road and so uh, 1990 rolls around, mm-hmm. which is my rookie year. Yep. Won the rookie of the year. I went to Denver. I think I placed at Denver that year, placed at San Antonio. And, mm-hmm. and in the meantime, we'd had a six or seven year old that Roy had over there that, that I'd been kind of playing with. And so to, to make all this as good as it could possibly be, I was right. I rode her at Denver and I rode her at San Antonio. Mm. And so I was went, kind of winning money on the in-house, you know, trained horse. Yes. Which was great. Yes. And so uh, spring rolled around, and, hell, we started looking for another horse and found one right there in Cypress right under our nose. Kelly Scott and Gary Thornton had a buckskin, and I went over and run a few calves on him, and I think they wanted twelve, fifteen thousand 15000 for him. And we ended up buying that one and shit, won the rookie of the year. And mm-hmm. 91, first world championship, and, I mean, it just kind of snowballed from there. But I, I, I think the thing that, that made me most of all is if had I got my card when I was 18 years old, would have never went anywhere. Tell me why. I, I was too big of a loose cannon. Yeah. Too too immature. Didn't have a set pattern. Yeah. Things were just too helter skelter. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah, very much no, so. No, nothing was flowing. Mm-hmm. I, I was distracted over here. Mm. I was girls over there. Yeah. Shit yes. over here. Yes. There there was just way too much going on, and mm-hmm. then. After I had to go back home and, and suck it up and, mm-hmm. and get a little grounded and get a little humility, some, some humility yeah. and structure and shit around me again, mm-hmm. then it, it made me realize where I actually wanted to be. Yeah. It's funny between that, that 18 and 22 years, you know, some talent and some money and some immaturity can do some fucked up things for kids kind of between yeah. 18 and 22. There, there's some violent years there, but if you don't stay on the straight and narrow, yeah. you can take a left turn real far. You could be winning the Kentucky Derby and take a left turn and be in the infield the real quick. Off the track. Yeah, off the track. Yeah. So um, talk to me a little bit about the horse training part of it. 
Did you like the horse training part of it as much as the competing part in those early years, or did you like the competing more than the horse training, or vice versa? You get what I'm trying to say? Oh yeah. I mean, I was I was really I I like training horses until mm -hmm. we started trying to mass produce them. Yes. And and put band aids on them. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. Band aid horse trainer. Yeah. Because my friends would show up and they'd say, "Hey, that's a good son of a bitch," and then me over here in the back of my mind, I got to be saying, "Hey, man." You didn't see what we just got doing done doing to that son of a bitch before. To make him act like this, yeah. 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 And you know, I and like really good friends. Mm. Like they brought he there's some people come over there and give a lot of money for horses back mm -hmm. in the early eighties. Yeah. And uh, a lot of them were my friends. Yeah. And I yeah. would try to tell them, Hey, you don't want him. Yeah. They would take him home, ride him for a week, and then they would be right back over there and trade that son of a bitch in on another. Me and you got the same problem. We're horrible salesmen when it comes to horses because we're too honest. Yeah. You, you know, but, you know, to, to really be good at selling a lot of horses, you've got to be able to bullshit and tell some bullshit. And my, one of my negatives is, is I'll tell you way more about the negatives than what I will the positives. Well. You know what I mean? <clears throat> you know, I'm probably going to get beat up a little bit for saying this. you got to be about half counterfeit to be a horse trader. For a horse trader, yes, yeah. very much so. you got to be a you got to be a salesman. The thing of it is, if... if if you come and get one from me, I want you to get along with him uh -huh. because I want to sell another one. Yes. I don't want to sell you some piece of shit that you're going to have problems with yeah. because then you're going to cuss the horse, you're going to cuss me. Yes, and tell everybody else yeah, too. Yeah, I don't, I don't want that. So as long as it was in quality, meaning that you had enough time to spend with each animal, and that's what I think people don't understand is these, these really expensive horses, they're really expensive because you're paying for the luxury of, of hundreds of hours that yeah. somebody spent with them. Yeah. You know, you know, there's only, I always tell people, there's only three ways to get a well-trained horse. You buy it trained, you pay somebody else to train it, or you train it yourself. Yeah. Pick your fucking poison. I don't care which one you pick. One of those. But three. one of those three's got to happen. It's got to happen. And, and, you know, really the horse is free. You're paying for the hundreds of hours that you put into it. Yeah. If a, if a horse is a hundred grand, you're not paying a hundred grand for that horse. You're paying for all the hours. Well, that's that's the thing that that pissed me off about that one of mine that yeah. yesterday. Yeah. You know, I three years. How do you get that back? You don't. You, you don't. Know what I mean, yeah, it's, you don't. It's three years worth of time just going down the drain. And not to boot, I mean, she's catting around just a super nice feeling. Yeah, man. yeah, that that's exactly right. Well, because I know people in different industries that love competing and just kind of go through the horse training part. Yeah. And they do it as a necessity. And then I know other guys that love the fucking horse training part of it, really eat that up, but aren't real high on the competing. And then there's other people that like both. And that's what I was just trying to get a feel from you is did you enjoy the horse training as much as being in front of the crowd and winning? I do, but there's a delicate balance there. Mm -hmm. And the thing, whenever I first started trying to wean myself off of rodeo and training, but I was training a little bit prior mm -hmm. to thinking about, you know, backing up just mm -hmm. a little bit. It's it's so hard to keep a competitive edge mm -hmm. and train. Yes. And, and the, the real reason is because you're always protecting your horse. Yes. And you're not beating nobody's ass worried about what your horse looks yes. like. Yes. It's funny. We're going to take a break straight after this. But I've heard this said in the performance horse world, and I really agree with it. Uh, there's three people that train a, that are involved with a horse's career. You've got a trainer, and his job's to train it. Okay. Yep. Then you've got a horseman, and his job's to take care of it, doctor it, look after it, make sure it's health care. You know, he worries about his horse's right. health. Yep. And then you've got a showman, and the showman he don't give a shit about the other two. He's out there for pussy and glory. That's all he's there for. He's out there to win, yep. get the trophy, fuck the girl, and go home. He don't give a shit about the horse trainer, and he sure as shit don't give about trouble about the horseman. And that is something to be said is that is that you have to you have to be in the mindset of a competitor you have to balance it don't you there is a fine line there isn't it clinton's grabbing a cocktail and we'll be right back get yourself one and enjoy this short clip nothing would please them more than to see this old piece of shit in a coffin all they want to drive a steel knife down a stupid fucking throat And they talk about it quite often Right, another one. I don't get this guy. He's a jerk. Absolutely. No denying that. I have owned and run my own businesses for 30 years. Good for you. Proud of you. If this is a conversation, you have no idea what a business is. Kristen Joy Johnson. Kristen Joy Johnson. 
Well, each to their own. I'm pretty proud of myself. Started with nothing, $400, retired with millions at 43, and moved to a strange country. So I'm pretty sure I know how to make money, and I'm pretty sure I know how to make a business. Now, it might not be your style, and that's okay. You might have a good style too, but my style is sure as shit work for me, beautiful. That's the one great thing about America. You can do whatever the fuck you want and still be successful if you work hard enough. Get after it, love. See Clinton Anderson and his Down Under Horsemanship Method live. Order tickets now for the Walkabout Tour, July 27th and 28th in Rancho Murrieta, California. For ticket information and a full list of upcoming tour dates and locations, visit downunderhorsemanship.com. So Fred, we freshened up a cocktail, we're back, and you're getting the bug back to rodeo and again. You kind of regrouped a little bit, yep. correct? Yeah. And that was important, looking back on it, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. How old are you now? 20 what? Uh, 21. 21, okay. 122. So what happens now? Well, uh, work, got a little money saved up, and <clears throat> been back. You know, trying to compete as much as I can, going to big jackpot. Got a couple of good horses. Got a, I got one. One. I got one. We're looking for another one. We had mm -hmm. had two. One got crippled, I think, and we kind of scrapped him because he was pretty much. Dead. When you say where, you're talking about you and where, as in we, you and Roy. Yes. You and Roy are a team again. Yes. Got each other's back. You're fucking after it. Yes. Right. Yeah. I like we, that. Our, our next step is is the ocean. That's what I used to call it back in the day. Yeah. And the reason why I called it the ocean, because there's stingrays, hammerheads, straight <laughs> whites. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. There, all the elements are there. Yeah. I never was satisfied at the amateur level mm -hmm. because I wasn't challenged enough. Yes. Nothing against anybody. that. No, I understand. I, just, I wanted to compete against the best guys in the world. So at 21, you got a good horse and you're competing against it. You got your pro card. What are you doing here? Yeah. Yep. Oh, got, yeah. Yep. No, I'd, I'd fill my permit. Yep. Got my card and off to my rookie year. Hell, it was, it cost a third of what it cost today to rodeo. You yeah. Know? So a guy in pickup trucks were, hell, I think the first truck I bought was 18000 Yeah. Now them some bitches are 100 grand. Yeah. Today. That's exactly right. You know what yep. I mean? That's exactly so right. So it's, uh, I had to have some income and looking at kind of getting my own place and, and moving out, moving around and stuff. And, had a girlfriend at the time, and mm -hmm. so things were pretty pretty subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, win the rookie of the year. Yep. Come back. This would have been ninety one now. Mm. So we're we're through ninety mm. into ninety one. Had a really good winner. Got two good horses. I got. Uh, we called her Trisha. Mm -hmm. That's his wife's name. Mm -hmm. So we named the mare after his wife. We got Trisha. We got Ernie. And then maybe even a third horse. I don't even know what the hell his name was, but yeah. anyway, we got three. And so got past the rookie of the year. And I think at the end of the year, I was in debt about 18,000. Truly. Yeah. So just r running up and down just the road. Running up and down the road. and So winnings aren't p covering it yet. No. Okay. No. Hey, Is that because just prize money, prize money in that world yeah, wasn't just, growing? Just costing too much. And yeah. prize money wasn't near where it should be. Yeah. So anyway, Get get through the NFR that year. Didn't win much at the finals. I think eighteen thousand. Was that the first trip to the NFR? First, first trip to Vegas. So first trip to Vegas. How was that experience? Oh, crazy as hell. I mean, <laughs> I showed up out there a day before the NFR started. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Stupid me. Yeah, but it, but you were in what twenty two by this yeah. stage, so twenty two year old. 21. 21. 21. 22. 22. 22. You make the NFR. That's got to be a dream of yours. Yeah. Yeah. From a little kid, no you're doubt. now on fucking TV. No doubt. You know what I mean? Did you, did you looking back on it, do you think you just took a little time to absorb some of that or you were just too young and stupid at that time to just see how much of a feat that was? You know what I mean? Like you looked up to these guys your whole life to be on TV no, and, I, and that. You know, after a little while, I, I felt like I deserved. Yes. Was I welcomed? Mm -hmm. Probably not. I mean, yep. there were there were a lot of guys that you know, uh, the old fashioned guys that mm -hmm. wasn't quite accustomed. Mm -hmm. I think Sylvester had been to the finals a couple of times, right? And maybe Charlie Sampson. Yes. You know what I mean? Yep. From from that standpoint, I don't think Calvin Greeley ever made it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 
And so I was doing stuff that, that hadn't been done, especially in the calf roping. Tell me what stuff that is. Again, I don't mean to be ignorant, no, but no, tell me exactly. African Americans qualifying for the national okay. finals. Right. right. Okay. That's that's exactly what I'm saying. Okay. I wasn't trying to. Yeah. No, I no, I just want you to say it, man. Yeah, this I'm is not. fucking what it is. Yeah. And and that's why I'm I'm going to ask you questions because I don't know. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? I want to know. Yeah. So you're going in there, and how was that rookie year? Not rookie year, but that first NFR was it. Was it uh, nervous? Was it competing at a whole nother level? Did you just take to it like a duck in water? Tell me about it that. Was, it was pretty much a shit show from my standpoint. Yes, fair enough. Honestly. Tell us what happened. Why was this shit show? The horses right. didn't work very good. Yep. I didn't rope very good. Yep. I got out there, the bright lights of Las Vegas. Yes. Just pretty much all over me. Yep. Honestly. Yep. But again, I mean, you're fucking 21 years old, yeah. Fred. Yeah. Let, let's be honest here. That's pretty young yeah. to have the lights camera action yes. on you. So, you know, you looking back on it, you'd cut any 21-year-old a little yeah. bit of slack there. And so I think out of the 10 rounds, I, I won a round, maybe split a round. Yeah. Won $18,000. So what was your biggest learning experience from that first NFR when you walked out the gate to drive home? You kind of got your ass whipped a little bit. What was the things going through your mind? You know what I learned? Yeah, I want to know. This right here will blow your mind. Yeah, I want to know. I learned what not to fucking do. That's a lot. That That's exactly what I learned the first year I went to. Tell me some, tell us what well, some of those things were. Partying. Mm-hmm. Yep, not to be partying. Run, running wild. Mm-hmm. God knows how much money I spent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, mean, just, I just didn't take care of business. Very yes, good. yes. Or I would have had at least another 20% more success than what I had. Yes. You know, I had all my high school friends out there, all my family, everybody said, oh, we're just going to Vegas. It's yeah. It's just yeah. one big party. I yes. Mean, we're not out here to rope. We're out yeah. here to have fun. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so my whole approach changed. Mm -hmm. After that, yes. And you know why? Because I showed up there the next year. I think I went in sixth, seventh in the world. I won 85000 and won the world the next year. Okay, so you got home. Did you kick, did, when you got home, did you kick your practicing, your horse training? Did you kick everything up to another level? I, I did, I did, but it, I took a little time off. My memory served me well. I took just a little bit of time off and I said, you know what, in order for me to get to the next level, I'm gonna have to change some shit. Okay, you like what I, had to change? I, I, I'm gonna have to change a few things around me yeah, people, I, you mean? People around yeah. me. And that does happen, doesn't it? At different I, I, times I, of your life, you have to exchange people out. I'm right. Because they're dragging you down. Change my approach. Mm -hmm. What does I, approach I, I mean? I need my approach and mm. everything. Okay. Physical, mental, the, the, the whole scope of yep. being a winner. Mm -hmm. Right? Because if you claim to be the best in the world, mm -hmm. and was I at the time? Probably not. Mm -hmm. In my mind, I was. Yes. But I wasn't prepared to be yes. the best in the world. Mm -hmm. There, There's two different concepts there. Yeah. So, and then I started practicing. And I said, I'm going to get up every morning. I'm going to jog a mile. I'm going to flank and tie. Then I'm going to run 20 head. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yep. And, and so, the, the, the preparation, I started to the fact to where I practiced so much to where I couldn't get it wrong. Yeah. You know, nothing stood in my way then. Mm -hmm. If I'm over-prepared, mm -hmm. then I'm not under-prepared. Yes. And I'm ready for any situation. Mm -hmm. That was my approach the next year. Well, hell, by the time uh, Odessa, Fort Worth, Denver, San Antonio was over, I think I was number one, number two in the world in 91. That's awesome. And, and so... I just said, you know what, man, this shit is not as hard mm -hmm. as I'm making it. I just need to, to simplify things and do things in, on the right approach and everything will be fine. So halfway through the season, I'm still number one in the world, 91. And mm -hmm. you know, I think I'd come home a little early because of that number one rank. And yep. I dropped down several spots. But hell, I went out there to the finals. I think I placed in six out of ten rounds. What's one. your horse flesh like that year? A good. Good. Really good. Yeah. Horses are working good. I, I had a buckskin, and then that's the year I bought Moon, too. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, my, my, my quality of horses were really good that okay. year. Okay. Are you having to buy them with your own money? Are you training these horses we're, yourself? No, no. We're, we're still buying them. We're always still kind of fronting me. And yep. After after the finals that year in 91, I won 83000 mm -hmm. 4000 I think I owed them about thirty. 
wrote them a check, paid them off, and yep. signed the R, here I go. Yep. Let me ask you something. You know, you won 80-something grand, but what was a damn good calf horse worth back in, the, in that day? 12.5 for the horse I won the world on that year. Truly. And he was already somewhat trained that Yes, year. sir. Okay. Somewhat trained. So he, when I, he hadn't been a lot. Yeah, hadn't been seasoned. Yes, hadn't been seasoned. But he was technically but trained. He was trained, So, yes. again, not to be ignorant in your world, but was that a lot of money in the rodeo world back then? That was cheap? Like, you know, cheap. Okay. Fairly inexpensive. So he could have cost 50 grand that same year. There would have been other horses top of the league that could have brought more? Yeah, 30, 40. 30, 40. I, I'm just trying to get a bit of an idea of what yeah. these horses are costing back then, because yeah. I'm going to ask you what they cost now. I have no idea in that world. <laughs> y you know what I mean? Uh, you know, you get what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. There was two at the NFR this year. I think they give 200, 250 for. Yeah. 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 How long is it, getting off subject just a little bit, but how long does it take to train a really good calf horse? Like the actual training part, not the seasoning and the lights, camera, action, but the actual fucking training of it. Is it a couple of years, three I years? Think, I think it's two, two and a half years to get a horse pattern the right way. Five days a week, six days a week. Yeah. Yeah. To where you can lean on him. Yeah. You know what I mean? It takes two years to train a fertility horse. And I do it I do it in reverse. Mm -hmm. I start them in the arena first. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I don't put them in the box until after their pattern. Is yes, the okay. Yes, that makes that's, sense That's my philosophy. A lot of people don't do it. But I, I think once you get a horse's mind settled mm -hmm. and he can go and do something, it's a lot easier to get him to break and leave the gate. Yes, because that's where all the pressure is. So yeah. that's where all the pressure yeah, is. Exactly. Fair enough. It's worked pretty good for me that way. Yeah, that's good. So uh, what happens now? You go back the second year, you, you know, you kick ass, you make the changes. You know, it's funny, isn't it? And funny in life, you seem to make a lot of changes when you get your ass whipped. Oh. When you're winning, you don't seem to make that many changes, There's do you? No problem. <laughs> but when you get your ass whipped, you start asking a few it, questions. It's the same thing in the business world. Yeah. As long as you're making a lot of money. Yeah. It can mask the problem. Oh, yes. But the minute you got to start shaving the fat a little bit, oh, yeah. all of a sudden all the problems surface. Yes, that's exactly right. You're damn right about that. <clears throat> um, uh, so tell us what happens now. You just keep doing that same, you just keep rodeoing what age, yeah, you know? Yeah, well, uh, Are you training? Uh, is the rodeo and paying your way at this time of your life? Is, is the winnings keeping you afloat yeah. during the year? Yeah. You're not in debt anymore going down the road? Are you training horses on the side? Tell me how you're making money. I'm not. I'm not really training at all. You're just rodeo. After I won the world, it was strictly rodeo. Okay. And you want to ideally have three horses. Three horses going down the road. Is that ideal? Yes. A good number. And one's lame. One's sick. One's not working. Mid nineties, I had five. Okay. Okay. And I would go A string, B string, C string. Okay. I would probably take those three horses on the road with me every summer. Yep. So, ninety two rolls around. Have. Decent winter, just kind of scouting, looking for other horses. You know. Are you trying to buy them semi-trained and then finish them, or you want them real green to where you do everything? I, I can do it either way. Do you have a preference? I would probably like one started. Started, right. Yeah. So a little bit, he's well, on track. And simply because it, it, it minimizes your time of having to yes. with them. Yes. You know what I mean? Yep. Like yep. You get one that's started that you can take and go ahead and rope on. and Showing some potential. Yeah, showing some potential. Yeah. Because, like we said earlier, you know, the, the turnaround for me, mm -hmm. it's it's three, three and a half years Yeah. If you, if you want a good one. Yeah. So let me ask you, talking about ages of horses in, in your world, okay, and again, I'm green at it. What is, is a six-year-old considered a young horse in your industry to be at the top of its game? Yeah. Okay, so what what is a typical age of a horse to be seasoned in your game? Ten years old, 12, eight? Eight, eight nine years old. Eight now, nine-year-old. The horse Haven rode this year is six years old. That's rare. That's rare. That's Just because of the maturity of them? Yeah. And they actually rode Reno, which is a horse that I own. Mm -hmm. Ball from Ken and Bolting House at Tom Epperson Training yep. and Road. By this stage, you know, so the third year you go to the NFI, have a good year? Yes. Everything's going good. Didn't win the world. No. Joe Beaver did that year. Okay. So let me ask you, as you're getting more popular now, people know who you are, you've bought a got a name for yourself, etc. 
Do you find it hard to buy horses? Are people fucking with you with the price because people don't want to sell you the good ones? I'll, I'll, you get what I'm trying to say? Like, as you get, like, I don't buy my own horses. I have a horse broker. Yeah. Because when people know I'm involved, they fuck with the price. Oh, yeah. You know, so I have a broker buy them that doesn't represent, doesn't tell them whose money it is because I have to do it that way. Yeah. Plus, he's all over the country. He can find them. I don't want to get on a plane and go all over the country. He's everywhere. So I'm just wondering, now that you've become successful, are people kind of thinking you're a little bit of a threat? and not wanting to sell you the good ones? Some, certain people won't sell you the good ones. Okay. But some people want to be involved. To and with a winner. Extent, and with a winner. That's good lot to be I've said had, there. I've had a couple of those deals come through, but I've also had whispers in the background of don't sell him that horse. Yes, yes, you know? because he's going to kick your ass yeah, with Yeah, he's going to kick your Fair ass enough. riding him. In. Yep. And I get it. I mean, I understand. It's a competitive it. world. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to ask a little bit about that, the age of the horses. Talking about the horses, what is the biggest Achilles heel in your industry with calf horses as far as is it their lameness, is it their mind, is it their fucking hawks? What is what is a common thing that seems to be the Achilles heel, if any, in keeping those good horses sound on the road, etc.? For for me, I was really, really fortunate. Okay. Never had one that was very crippled. Mm -hmm. Never had one that we had to maintenance all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, supplement stuff yeah. like that, inject yeah. them every six six months. But never, like I've seen people have horses with ring bow. Yes. And they're trying to get the last runs out of them. Yes. You know, inject them, kill the nerves every time they run one on them. I, I, I've seen that. Yes. And I would not be being honest if I said No, that. I've seen it too, you yes. Know what I mean? Yes. But... Uh, I just wondered how hard it is to keep those horses at that level sound and working long term. It, Do they have six months off and six months on the road, or is it they're busy all year? They're they're pretty much busy all year. Okay. You know, uh, like I would go in the winter. I wouldn't do a lot in the spring. If I did, I went to California a couple of rodeos yeah. and come home. But then the summertime, they got to be ready to go. I would take better care of my horses than I did myself most of the time. Yes. And and that's rare. Yes. I know a lot in of that people world. Do nowadays. Yeah. But, but back then. then back yeah. then they had them old junky ass trailers that mm -hmm. didn't have air ride. If yes. You know what I mean? Yep. Just beat them to death up and down the road. And yeah. So uh, everything's changed. The technology's so good now mm. that, that you can really, really uh, take care and support. Horses. Those horses. You well, you kind of have to. State there when you say you have to, you should fucking do it anyway. Right. But right. my point is. When I say you have to, they're so damn expensive now, yes. Fred, you can't afford not to. Exactly. They're almost a luxury now, but a cowboy can't afford. And the thing about it is every run on a good one could be your last run. Yeah. Yeah, it damn could be. Especially yeah. the and, – and, and, and the good ones seem to get hurt more than the average ones or the go. sorry ones, you know. What is an what is a big if you're on the on the road rodeo in, in, a, in a typical year and when you're in your prime and you're fucking running and gunning – would 50,000 miles be a lot on a horse in a year? 100,000 miles going down the road? How many miles a year would you be doing with these good horses going down the road? Th this is going to sound crazy to you, but I averaged 100,000 miles a year for eight, nine, ten years in a row. Yeah. Average. Trucks, horses, thousand. the whole thing, just yes. going down the road. Yes. Yeah. That doesn't surprise I mean, me. I, I, just I would no get idea. a new truck in, in January, yeah. right after the finals, in December of that year, mm -hmm. and had 100,000 miles on. Okay. You know, and I put 115 one year yeah. on one pickup truck. And, I mean, did I haul all of my horses all those miles? Probably not. Mm -hmm. You know, I would take, like, say after the summer's over, I'd send Moon home, send Reno home because I'm going to Pendleton, <clears throat> Albuquerque, St. George, a few more rodeos in Utah, and then I'm headed headed south. But you've always got somebody with you to yes. take care of the horses yes. so you can focus on, on competing, correct? Most definitely. You're staying in living quarters, horse trailers? Yes. What are you doing? Hotels? Well, it was Capri campers for me. Yep. Then I went to living quarters trailers. And so I you're never, towing a bumper pull with the Capris, yeah. yep. And I never had. I had a 650. Yep. That had a trailer that was longer than mm -hmm. all get out. Had two bedrooms, da 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 mm -hmm. yep. All of that fancy shit. But yep. Nowadays, they got toter homes and big buses, and mm -hmm. I mean, it's gotten plum out of hand. Hell, they don't have no room to park all that shit no more at the, yeah. at the yeah. fairgrounds. So, talk to me a little bit about uh, either camaraderie with the other calf ropers or the competition aspect. 
did you guys as a whole get along or just, you know, high from a distance, general respect for each other? Or, or was there a lot of like, I suppose what I'm trying to ask is one thing I've noticed about the cow horse industry, and I don't know if it's just completely unique to this culture of that industry. Everybody supports everybody. There's trainers at the back gate and you're having a hell of a fucking run. They're fucking cheering. Like it's not counterfeit either. They're, they're wanting you to, there's a hell of a culture in that industry that I have never seen it in the rain. And the rain is very individual. You win, they'd like to stab you in the fucking eye. You know what I mean? Yeah. In the cow horse industry, there's a lot of camaraderie between the trainers and, you know, you do good, like, you know, you do good, you'll have 30 texts on your phone. Kick, you kicked ass today, man. That's fucking awesome. Is it, what was it like back in those days? You know, the camaraderie used to be good. Mm -hmm. As far as, is like, today's world, and, I mean, it, I would not be doing the sport and injustice to speak on today, because I've been removed from it now since... About 2016, yes. you know, from a real competitive yeah. side. I go around a little bit now, and I'm like the old guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. And so, so we've done things a little different. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. there was a lot of jealousy back, back when I wrote it. Yes, fair enough. You know, and I've heard people even say if he wasn't black, they wouldn't be making a big deal out of mm -hmm. it. Which, I mean, that's your opinion. I, yeah. I don't really give a shit. What I had heard from somebody very, I won't say their name, but very well respected in that world, and when I asked him about the era that you were competing, this particular person said they were all cutthroat. They had to be. They were fucking tough. They had to be tough. It was a different world back then, and they, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world, yeah. and they had to be tough on each other to get by. That's what they told me. They said, now, they a lot of the guys get along now. They're all buddies, etc. but back in then, when Fred was really running and gunning, Everybody was trying to slit each other's throats. The competition was that fucking tough. Well, That's what I'd heard. And the thing about it is, okay, there there has to be a little bit of envy mm -hmm. to separate yourself from the competition. Yes. Nobody will admit to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will. Yeah. I used to just do shit just to to get get ready. <laughs> you know I mean? Yeah, I understand. And and I, I can tell you this. This happened one night in front of me. So Joe Beaver and I were getting ready to have a big match roping out at San Angelo. Mm -hmm. And this Cody Old calls him in the middle of the night. We've been out drinking, drunk. Mm -hmm. And I said, don't do it. Don't do it. And he freaking calls him on the phone. He says, I tell you what, you fat son of a bitch. That Fred Whitfield's going to stick it on your fat ass come <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> hey, Joe's wife called my house back and I said, you dumb son of a bitch. You are in trouble. And, and, I mean, we just done stupid shit all the yeah. time. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, fortunately for us, we didn't have cell phones. Yes. <laughs> we, we would be in a world of hurt. And, I mean, it was just, you know, the thing of it is, if we didn't like you, you knew it. Yeah, but it wasn't a counterfeit bullshit. Yeah. yeah. If, if if I didn't like you, you knew it. Yeah. And I'm that way today. Yes, If I don't I am give too. a shit about somebody, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Yes, I, yes. I don't fuck with you. Yeah. And it's my prerogative. That's right. I'm not I'm not out to throw mud on you, but I'm gonna walk past you. I, I can yeah. respect that one hundred percent. I can respect that. Who was um in your peak of your career, who were the competitors that challenged you the most or you had the most respect from as well, as a competitor? It, it started with Joe. Yep. Without a doubt, because I had to go through him to get my first title. Yep. And then for the most part it was Cody O. Mm -hmm. You know, he was around for most of those years, but uh, a friend of mine told me one time, he said, hey, he said, that's the biggest threat in the world to you right there. Yeah. I said, I don't give a shit. He don't scare me. Yeah. And and so had I not had anything to do with him, mm. who knows? Yes. I mean, th those eight gold buckles could have turned into 10 or 12. Yeah. We'll never know. Mm -hmm. But I was that type of guy that I didn't fear competition. Yes. So why was I not going to, yeah. you know, help him out? It. He was a rookie, da 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 Yeah. So, and then... Brent Lewis, I guess, was there for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then maybe uh, Blair Burke. Okay. Those are the four that come to mind. And, I mean, as far as a real rivalry, probably Cody. Yeah. Because, I mean, Cody won the world in 97, 8. Mm -hmm. I was a reserve world champion both times. Yep. Then I won it in 99, won it in 2000. And he won it in 01, I won it in 02. He won it in 03, and I won it in 05. What's the last time I won the world? Okay. So – during this period now, are you getting 
tell us about living on the road. That tell us some things about living on the road that people may not, if they're not in the rodeo world, don't understand. It looks glamorous in front of the crowd. Looks glamorous at the NFR. But there's got to be a fucking grind being on that road, correct? Well, the thing for me, like, I mean, after probably ninety five, six, something in there, mm-hmm. you know, been dating the same girl for several years. Yes, we broke up. Went through a couple years of being a renegade again. Yep, I understand. You know, running around, yep. just doing whatever. Yep. No, no real structure. It's probably why I didn't win the world those years, too. Oh, yeah. That yeah, you're I mean, damn right. If we're being honest. Uh, hey, listen, pussy yeah. or sidetrack a man quicker than fucking anything. Yes. And so then I meet the lady that I'm married to now mm-hmm. in 97. Yeah. In the fall of 97. And we dated for three years mm-hmm. and then got married. Mm-hmm. Well, baby number one comes along in 2000. And so... She traveled with me, you know, 98, 99. That give you a lot of stability? Yes. How'd that, how'd that affect you roping? It, it didn't. didn't. I mean, I was, I was ready to settle down, and I right. mean, hell, I'm... How old are you? What a, shit, I'm 30. Yeah. You know, I think I was 33. So you're ready to settle down mentally? Yeah. yeah, and so, I mean, real life, would, I'd bought a place over there in, in uh, Hockley, mm-hmm. and... Uh, let me ask you, when you had your first kid, did it make you hungrier to win? Did it take some of the aggression away from you? I've heard people say that when they had kids, I was always, I never, I don't have any kids. And at one point I was thinking about having some, and you know, on my bit, well, having one, but one of my biggest fears was I, I was worried it would take my drive away. Like I was so focused on my business and, and running and making money. And I had a lot of people say it's funny when you have kids, it actually makes you work harder because you got to build something now. You yep. got to. It made it, a lot of people said it made them more focused. I just wonder what it did for you. Yeah, I think it made me more focused. I mean, to to sit there and watch my little girl being born and all the stuff that we kind of went through. I mean, she didn't have a bad time with it, but yeah, I mean, it was damn sure a struggle for mm-hmm. eighteen hours, whatever. Yes, and she's in labor for, but uh, I mean it it changed my perspective about life Mm -hmm. you know seeing her born seeing savannah born and uh then hell taking her i guess she was born in august and we had a few months and then we took her right to the nfr that year so you guys just kept traveling together yes yes we kept traveling she stayed home for a little bit and her mother come from california yeah and stayed with her and so did your wife come from the rodeo world or not? No, not really. No, no. didn't grow up in that not, industry. Not at all. Right, right. Yep. So at this point, you're making a, uh, a decent living going down the road. You're paying your bills. You may not be getting rich, but you're making a good living. Here, Here's the deal that, that, that we hadn't touched on is cinch. Okay. So cinch come to me in 1996. Right, right. And when I'd, they got started. I'd had, I'd had a contract with Wrangler. Mm-hmm. And so supposedly I'd been seen wearing polo shirts at the NFR. So, and I'd won the world 95, 96 mm. back to back. So I was due a $25,000 bonus, which I didn't get paid because somebody told somebody mm. that we're not real sure that he fits in with our Wrangler family. Said, That's fine. Yeah. We don't have a problem with that. Yeah. We'll find another endorsement. Yeah. And so Michael Dvorak came along from Cinch. I remember Michael. He said, man, we don't have much money. I said, it's whatever y'all want to do. I don't care. Mm. Hell, let's grow together. Mm-hmm. So we signed a little contract on a paper napkin. And uh, what's that been, 26 years later? Yeah. 27 years later? Still with them. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so, and, and back then, you know the whole deal. We we couldn't wear the Cinch logo. And these are, oh, yeah. Or none of that shit. They had parameters. How how important was the endorsements back in those days, Fred, to to help pay the bills to get well, down they, the road? They were real important because yeah. I'd had a trailer deal, mm-hmm. and then I got the deal with uh, Cinch, mm-hmm. and I had a fuel sponsor, okay, which was Moffitt. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's real. It's life. It's it's life changing stuff. Yeah, right. You got to get down the road. Yes, yeah, sir. You got to get down the road. Tell us um, 
if people that aren't familiar with it, what is the biggest stressful part about living on the road rodeo? And is it the is it the travel schedule? Is it the not living at home? Is it the family life that puts stress on people that don't live that world? What do you think they probably don't uh, understand about it? The the biggest part, the biggest component, the financial. Okay, mm -hmm. if a guy doesn't have a lot of endorsements, if you've got a family, mm -hmm. that's would probably be the second part of it. Yep, you know. If your family's not going to travel with you, then they're home. Yeah. Your wife's probably working. Yep. If you got kids. Yep, you're not seeing them. You're not seeing them, you know. And then the third part of that is getting your ass up every day trying to be competitive and win mm -hmm. to support what you're doing. Plus, you've got a whole other set of bills mm. waiting for your ass at home mm -hmm. if you don't win. Yeah. So there's some fucking pressure there. Oh yeah, there's the the press the pressure is astronomical. Yes. There there's no two ways about it. And for me, you know, back to my rookie year and all that stuff, here's an open checkbook. You go do what you do mm. and let us worry about the finances. Mm -hmm. You know, I had that luxury. Everybody doesn't have that luxury. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So it, that that's one of the biggest burdens in the sport mm -hmm. is being able to afford to just go go for a month. If you don't win nothing, yeah, you're not riding hot shit. Out of all the the sports in the rodeo, is yours one of the most expensive? Because you've got to have three horses. Like the Saddlebrunt rider, he just flies in. He, oh, he's not taking it. horses without with him. Yeah. You you you've got one of the most expensive sports yes, there, correct? Because you're doubt. hauling multiple horses down the road. Without a doubt, without a doubt, there's no two ways around it. And I mean, hell, I, the last year I rodeoed, which was probably 2014. Mm -hmm. We, me and my wife sat down and we had a heart to heart. I said, it's going to cost us about 200 grand mm -hmm. to get back in full fledged. Yeah. That's a new truck mm -hmm. and a new horse. And I mean, pick your poison. Yeah. You got to have both. Yeah, you do. You, you need to go find a horse that's better than all the ones you got. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost you a hundred thousand mm -hmm. minimum. And then you got to sacrifice an entire season. That's going to cost you about. 80 just to go. So I said 200. There's 280 right off the top of my, yeah. my list. You know what I mean? And, and I just said, you know, I I personally don't think it's worth it. We had a place over there in Hockley that was paid for. Didn't know a single dime. I bought it with the first money that I won at Calgary. Yep. And that place had turned into to north of 800 grand. That's awesome. To walk out the door. You know what I mean? Yeah. I and so it. as far as. My concern, that that was my best investment that I ever made. The real estate, You know yeah. what I mean? I, I bought that place with money that, that I'd won mm -hmm. from roping. Kept it together, paid it off, yeah. built, built stuff up on it. And then to be able to turn around and, and sell that place and go pay cash for another one and not, not I've never had a mortgage. That's awesome. You know? Let me ask you, when you had that hot to hot with your wife, did you go back on the road that year or not? No. No. No, I said no. it. Was it your decision? It's pretty much done. Were, uh, you burn out, were you burn out? And I don't mean that disrespectfully, but were you tired by this point? How old are you, Fred? Well, I mean, hell, I, I made the finals in 2012 when I was 46 years old, mm -hmm. which is unheard of yes. in the calf rope. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And had a chance to win the world that year. A few little mishaps mm -hmm. here and there. Yeah. I mean, you can go back and always fix some shit yeah. that, that you see now. You know what I mean? Was I burnt out? I was tired of the battles, honestly. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I'm talking internal battles. This is with the association and the way they're doing things. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, a guy goes from, from 1990 to, to 2015, mm -hmm. and it's gotten better, mm -hmm. but it's not great. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so you spend half your time trying to figure out how the system works mm -hmm. and by the time you get the system figured out the system's working against your ass okay but change it again and you're done you, mm -hmm. you're just done with all the battles and and to be real honest with you man i had a great career yes well clearly uh, yes. loved by tons mm -hmm. not liked by a few but my biggest deal was clinton i did it my way yeah you know what i mean i i never really and and I don't mean this in a bad way, but I just never kissed any ass, or mm -hmm. I, I just done it the way Fred thought it needed to be done, and and I was successful at it, mm -hmm. and and that's the thing. Like you could take all the money in the world and still have problems, right? Yes, of course you do. All the success in the world and still have problems. I don't think you can name a winner, Fred, in any fucking industry that's not hated. 
They have their, their people that love them. Yeah. And they have the, you know, t take Ronald Reagan, okay? Reagan was one of the greatest presidents the United States ever had, okay? But I, he was well before my time. But I asked people that were alive when Reagan was president, and I said, when he was in president, did, were there people who hated him? He said, hell yes. Hell yeah. Lots of people hated him. Now that he's dead, everybody loves him. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't give a yeah, fuck who you are. Half the people are going to love you, and half the people are going to fucking hate you. Same with me. And in, and in fact, I almost think you have to be hated if you're going to be a winner. Because that's the, that's the thing called jealousy. Right. People, America loves the fucking underdog. They love you when you're Rocky Balboa, you're broke, you're fucking homeless, you're eating dog food. The minute you and then you the whip, the, whip somebody's ass and you're the fucking champion, they want to take your ass down. It's a funny culture. You know, they love the underdog and once they build you up, then they love the next underdog and they can't wait to see you fucking run to the bottom, you know, fall down the stairs. Yeah. So I think, honestly, if you're hated on, you're being successful. I don't want to be well-liked because if you're well-liked, nobody hates on losers. They hate on fucking winners. Let's be honest about that. You know what I mean? Nobody hates on the homeless guy. Seriously. No. They hate on winners. Not everybody, of course, but a lot of... So to me, I think that hate is a fucking badge of honor. No. Take it as a badge of honor because it if you're not you, doing well, doing they don't want to talk about you. you're doing something you're right. You're damn right it does. You're damn right it does. So by this, so how old are you when you decide with you and your wife sit down and say fuck it, we're we're going to retire? How old from 40? from rodeo? Uh, 40. 49, 48. Okay, yeah. okay. So at that point, how are you going to make a living? What what's in your head? You're going to train horses? You're going to sell horses? What are you going to do? Here's the deal. We've been back training. I've got my twelve year old daughter's on the ride. I sent her to a Josie clinic. Yeah. And in the meantime, I've gotten two or three calf horses that I've got people around Texas running barrels on. We're going to create us a little barrel racer. Okay. Well, that lasted about six months. Right. We got a new truck and a new trailer and sent her off, and she's dressed up like Fallon Taylor, which... <laughs> I love it. You know that hurt Fred's dad's old heart, don't yeah. you? <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't ride a frisky stick horse, and she'd just be bopping around. <laughs> I got Brittany calling her and Fallon calling her and... So we did that for just a little bit, and we go to a few them little yellow rows, lead through the burn yeah. straightaways and stuff. And on the way home one night, we had a couple trainers with us, and we're just spinning like we're fucking rich, you know what I mean? And I told my <laughs> wife, I said, hey, honey, I said, listen, I said, we need to get rid of all these high-dollar-ass horses and learn her, you know, get her just a dink yeah. to learn how to ride on. Yeah. Well... About three or four months went by, and she didn't come back out to the arena, and I sold every one of them some bitches. Yeah, that's exactly and, what you need. And that was the end of it, you yeah. know. And so, but hell, I'd been riding some outside horses, and uh, is there a big demand with your with your level of expertise and knowledge? Is there a big demand for people for you to train the next great rope horse? It is. It, it really, honestly, is. The the turnaround is just not as fast as a guy like, would like. You know what I mean? What do you mean by as turnaround? Far as, as far as getting one trained, getting mm -hmm. seasoned, yeah. selling. Yeah. It's not, not an overnight. No, thing. not at all. Like we already spoke and about, so, it's two or three years, yes. yes. And so, I mean, hell. Is there more money now? Like, what's a great calf horse going to sell for today? Uh, 200 grand? Yeah. Man, I sold one here a while back for 80. Yep. You know, that, that had come directly mm -hmm. through me. And I got one now that I want a hundred for. Mm -hmm. you know, I've been two yep. and a half years, three years training. It seems like when you got a good one now, it doesn't matter what discipline it is, Fred. Somebody will write a check. Yeah, because they're so hard to find. Well, and I just haven't run across the right person. And yeah, uh, for me, I'm trying to put her in the right hand. Mm -hmm. Yes, I don't. I don't want to just sell her mm -hmm. to anybody. No, anybody can fuck her up. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So she's she's. And the one that passed away, which we will we'll never know now. Yeah. So I had two. Yeah. And I try to keep two, so that way. So what? I sell one. And that's what. So what are you doing now to make a living? I'm working. You're I'm working. Working from office services. I'm in outside sales. That's awesome. And I'm I'm riding. So you ride two or three a day. Yep. 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 You know the fun part about that is it still keeps it fun. Yes. It's not a job by the sounds yes. of it. It's still passionate. Still fun. Yes. Yes. There's something to be said about that, isn't there? Yeah. About keeping something you enjoy just fun. Yeah, and, and and for me, you know, when I decided to go to work, I said I gotta work as hard at, at something else as I did it. Yes. At roping. Yeah. So 
I mean, I don't have to have a hundred percent success. Hell, if I have seventy, yeah, now I'm gonna be okay. And yeah, hell, I've I've had this job for five years now, mm -hmm. so since 2018. Mm -hmm. And uh, like I said, we sold the place over there, moved into town. There's not an arena at my house. My arena's 11 miles away. And so I, I went to work, you know, mm -hmm. that living off of, of what you've done in the past. It's working now. Yeah. But it wasn't very financial yes. when I decided that this shit is done. You know it seems I mean? like in your industry, and when I say your industry, the, the entire rodeo industry, Fred, from the outside looking in, okay, again, I wasn't in that world, but the outside looking in, it seems like very few cowboys got to put enough away, enough money like you did to actually buy a place. It seems like three quarters of them just piss the money away. From the outside looking in, they either piss it away or don't financially put it in the right areas. And then 25% of them are smart enough to save it, invest it, do something successful with it. But what definitely seems to happen is at the end of their careers, you got to figure out how you're going to make a living. You got to figure out how, how are you going to take all those years of talent and buckles and how do they, how do you turn those buckles into paying a mortgage? That's, that's a real, real valid question. Yeah. And, and I mean, it happens every day, but fortunately for me, I got to witness several of those guys that died broke, hang around. Mm -hmm. First of all, try to be competitive too long. Yeah, that's number one. Mm -hmm. No one to so, no one to quit, isn't it? Exactly. That's pretty tough, isn't no, it? Think no, about that. No How many world hold? champion boxers, Fred, go for one more round? Yeah. They go for one more title and they get their ass whipped. Yeah. You know how many fucking bank robbers go for one more bank? Yeah. See, you know they robbed five and got away with it, but they go for that sixth one. There, listen, Father Times is undefeated. Mm -hmm. There's just no doubt about it. Yeah. No matter how good you are, sooner or later your ass can't tie one in seventh. Yeah. Or you can't spur one to 90. Yes. No yeah. matter how good you are. Yeah. yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yes. And so a guy has to be able to close the door mm -hmm. on that chapter and move to the next. Yes. If you keep reliving the same, re listen, if I go through town, every time I come through town out here and all the lights are red, and they build a loop going around. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You got to change and adapt, man. That, yeah. That's just the way the world works. Yeah, you do have to change and adapt. How do you know what it takes to become successful? Talk to someone who's done it. Clinton Anderson became a multimillionaire by leveraging his passion for horse training into a global brand and media empire, starting with nothing but the change in his pocket and the will to succeed. In doing so, he revolutionized an industry and became a celebrity. Now, you can put his experience and advice to work for your business. With Clinton Anderson's business consultancy, you can tap into Clinton's unique perspective, hear his straight talk, and get his no-nonsense advice. Just imagine yourself armed with Clinton's hard-earned knowledge and entrepreneurial spirit. So whether you own a ranch or any sort of business at all, we invite you to discover the transformative power of Clinton Anderson's leadership and innovation in your business. Call 1-888-287-7432 to take your business to the next level today. Looking back on your career, is there anything you might do differently? You know, and this is going to sound crazy, the only thing that, that, that I didn't accomplish, I didn't win a AQHA Calf Horse of the Year, mm -hmm. which we can't change that now. Yeah. I would have loved to have ridden a horse that I had a hand in training myself at the NFR. Okay. And that's what I was kind of working towards, towards the end. I'm not sure it just, mm -hmm. just didn't happen. Yeah. You know? Yep. Yep. That, that's one of the only things, you know, I... I've had a great career, got a lot of good friends, Clinton. I'm still friends with people I met my rookie year. It's yeah. been 33 years ago. We still talk on the phone. Mm. Even though we don't see each other every day, it's just like. You just pick it up we're... like you'd always yeah, exactly. do. Exactly. When we pit, when we were around each other, it's, hey, how you doing? Good to see you. That's awesome. Been too damn long, you know. And I've met a few that I don't care to see anymore, too. <laughs> You know? That's life. Let me ask you, you told me when you before the cameras rolled that you were just at the NFR just now and you hadn't been there in how many years? Since 2019. Okay, so it's 2023, so five years. Anything, you, did it bring any emotions back? You haven't been there for five years, you walk in the building, anything struck a nerve, anything fucking ring a bell? No, you know, I, I got over that 
uh, fairly quickly. Okay. You know, I, I would go like 2013, 2014, mm-hmm. and I would sit up in the stands, and I'd be like, how about these no roping son bitches? I should be down there. <laughs> I mean, I would. I yeah. would get pissed off if yeah. I was angry. Yeah. But this year, nay. Yeah. You know, I was out there helping <coughs> Chad Mayfield, mm-hmm. which John Douch and, and uh, Corey Solomon, they both qualified, and then Weston Hughes, who lives not far from me over at Cameron. Mm. And uh, so, it, I mean, it was great to see all the guys and, and watch yeah. the competition this year. You know, they broke several records. And hell, Chad tied one six ones. Calf got up, but it's just part of it. But what's uh, di- what's different about if if okay, first part of it, nothing may be different. But is there anything different now with the young guys that are that are winning today at this last NFR? Did anything? Sh- uh, jump out at you horse flesh wise rope wise uh, athletic ability wise anything jump out at you said oh that's that's changed bigger horses smaller horses anything change at all mate no no pretty the, same yeah the calves were so much better uh today than what we roped back okay. never what do you mean by that. better first of all there wasn't i never seen a calf out there that would eliminate you okay from the rodeo yeah I've seen some that, you know, a few that might outrun your ass if you miss a barrier too yeah, much. Yeah, yeah. Back when I qualified, there was calves in the pins that would straight up eliminate you. Yeah. Because they'd run left, run right. What well, would they yeah. do? Haul Stop. Ass, big kick. Yeah. Just eat your ass up. Yeah. And, I mean, I never saw one of those this year. I thought as far as the quality of horses go, I mean, I could pit the horse tough road was really good. Horse haven road was really good. The horse uh, – I knew this shit would happen. Uh, Chad wrote, mm-hmm. worked good. Corey's horse was good. Yep. I mean, five or six out of the top 15, maybe seven mm-hmm. horses that were really nice. Mm-hmm. And I mean, hell, that's part of the battle. Yeah. Uh, everybody that's winning has got one thing in common. They're all riding a great horse. Yep. Okay. I think the days have gone in any of the Western industries, Western disciplines. I can't speak for the English world, but Western world, I don't give a fuck if it's cutting, raining, cows, barrel racing. If you're not well mounted, you don't have a chance. Well, you, yeah, you know, yeah. you don't, you have to have a great one, not an average uh, one to win a great one. I, I probably shouldn't speak on this, but I'm going to just because yeah. I'm in the sport. That's just like the barrel racing. Mm-hmm. You know, before it was sister... Uh, the other little girl from right there, Toller's her horse. Mm-hmm. Man, Dunsum is running thirteen threes out there this year. Yeah, in the barrel racing, mm-hmm. that's unheard of. Yeah, you know, it used to be sister, sister, sister. Now she is sister barely placing. Yeah, these yeah. girls have trained these some bitches up to where they could just turn the barrels and, and go and be gone. Yeah, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. What's do you think in today's money? Everything's going up. So, you know, prize money's clearly going up since you were competing. But so of expenses. Do you think it's still pretty balanced if you had to look in from the outside or not? Hasn't risen to the cost of inflation. Okay. So it's you, it's more expensive now to go do you, it. You go and 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 win around out there at the NFR, pays thirty thousand. Mm-hmm. Last time I qualified, I think it was fifteen or sixteen, mm-hmm. which has been what, eleven years ago? Yeah, yeah. A new truck costs a hundred thousand today. Oh yeah. The average is paying eighty. Mm-hmm. So if you left the NFR with the average win, you can't go pay cash for a new truck. Doesn't don't you think that's doomed for the sport of rodeo? Don't you think it's doomed? If it if it keeps yeah. up with these numbers, it, how is it going to survive? It has to change, and the numbers have to go up every year. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes, it we, does. We can't increase the payoff by a thousand dollars for yes. ten straight years. Yes. You know what I mean? It's not enough. That, that that's a slap in the face because. The money that it brings into that economy. Yeah, and those them casinos. Them somebody added 30, 40 million, they wouldn't miss it. Yes. And that's my opinion. I agree with you 100%. So I've heard that from. off when I come back to Vegas. <laughs> I've heard that from multiple people. Yeah. That, yeah. that there should be a lot more money in it. It seems a little bit doomed for a young guy that unless you've got a wealthy family or you've got some sponsors that are willing to, to take you under their wing, you're kind of screwed. Like well, it's going to be hard to go down the road. You have to have sponsors. Yeah. It's impossible to do it in today's world without sponsors. Yeah. Back when you were doing it, you could kind of get by. Yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, things just didn't cost as much. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do any coaching or or teaching now? I do. Okay. Do do you enjoy it? Do you not enjoy it? I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. But like I said, I 
Do you come across any young guys with the hunger well. like you had? No. No. Yeah. No. I'm not surprised. No. Yeah. And I'm, it's hard it, when you got. I would not be being honest with you. No, if I told I'm you. I'm glad you did. I mean, it's I, hard to find. It's hard to find uh, when you got that hunger and passion. It's almost uh, a little bit depressing when you teach people that don't have the same hunger and passion. Right. Would you agree with that? You're 100 percent right. Yeah. And you know, I I sit and I watch my girls. Mm. They play volleyball or they did. Mm. Savannah doesn't anymore. She's graduated, but. Like she had my fire. Mm. My other one's a lot more laid back, kind of like my wife. Yeah. And I said to myself the whole time, I'd like to flip it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would like to put, because Savannah's freaking five seven, mm -hmm. Sydney's six foot. Yeah. I would like to to switch mm -hmm. them two. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, you talking about freaking phenomenal? <laughs> Because, I mean, they both got a vertical. Yeah. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, But one don't give a shit about it, and the other one would kill the dude. And here's the funny part. You can't put the give a shit in them, can no. you? No. You can't. I used to be naive enough to think that if you rip their ass enough, motivate them enough, encourage them enough, they'd do it. It's either, the, the fire's either in them, Fred, or it isn't, isn't yeah. it? It's either fucking there or it's not. Yes, and I, I tell people all the time, if I could bottle passion up, I'd be a rich so You're damn right. Chump. You're damn right. You would I mean, be. I'd just, I would, man, yeah. because... You can't make somebody crave or be about half lunatic to do something. It's either in you or it's not. Yeah, and a lot of that depends. It's That is true, but also it depends on how you're mentored and who's around you to bring that right. fire out and mentor right. that fire. One of the things I love about the podcast, you know, I do this for fun. I'm not making any fucking money doing it. It costs me about 75 grand a year to do it, and it's something fun. I enjoy talking to people like yourself that are champions and come from nothing and made something of their lives. And I've noticed a lot of young people will walk up to me just out and about. People, I don't know these people, but they recognize me. And they'll walk up to me and they'll shake my hand and say, man, I love the podcast. I listen to it all the time. It's made me hungry. I'm going out there and making more money. I'm trying harder. I love seeing young people get fucking hungry. I love seeing young people do well in their lives. You know what I'm trying? That makes me hungry. At, this, at my age now, I'm getting a lot of fire back in me. Not that I'm that old, but... I'm mentoring a lot of younger people now because all my friends, Fred, were 25 years older than me. I w I've been an old soul most of my life. As all my friends and mentors have always been 20 to 25 years older than me. Well, they're starting to die now. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? And I'm finding now I'm getting a lot of passion from helping younger people. And uh, I, that gives me a lot of joy to see young people want to get hungry, want to be successful, want to do things. And, and I think the podcast is making a difference in people because they tell me it is. They shake me, and I can tell by the way they look me in the eye and saying, this has fucking made me motivated. It's made me get out of bed earlier. And I love that. I love seeing young people. Probably the biggest thing that pisses me off, Fred, is seeing young, talented people fuck away at their lives. Right. Nothing upsets me more than seeing just pure talent just get pissed away. And often it happens because the people that are the most talented and shit at life typically don't have the best work ethic. Right. And the people that aren't that talented, myself included, had the great work ethic, yeah. but we just weren't that talented. You know, when you can get both, it's a rare combination, isn't it? Yes, sir. But typically talent doesn't always come with hard work and yeah. typically hard work doesn't come with talent. You know, there was a guy that uh, I read a book, I can't remember the name of it now. He interviewed a, a ton of uh, Olympic world champions and... Um, because he wanted to see in all the different sports what made these Olympic champions tick, what made them tick, and it was. And when he asked the competitors, "What's your, you know, what's your greatest strength, or why do you think you won a gold medal, and all that kind of stuff?" Never did he said they said talent. Talent was never mentioned. I had a really? talent. You know what they said? Passion. I just worked harder. I just wanted it more. And all of them admitted that they weren't naturally that talented. What they did admit to is that they just had to really work their ass off. Yeah. Does that make sense? That was the one yeah. common theme oh, yeah. in his book. It, it's rare to have both. Yeah. But I always felt like I had both because mm -hmm. honestly, I never worked out. You know, lifted yep. weights and done all that shit. It yep. was just it was just natural ability. Yep. You yep. know what I mean? Yeah. But it, but and again, it's rare to have natural ability and work ethic. You had both, but you got to admit that's rare, correct? Yeah. Oh, no. So Fred, the last question I want to ask you, and I ask every guest this. Uh, and I get lots of great different answers and things, but if you had to go back to a 20-year-old Fred Whitfield, what would you tell yourself now, if anything, to give you some of some advice? If you could go back and talk to a 21-year-old Fred Whitfield, what would you tell yourself? talk to a 21-year-old Fred Whitfield today. 
It could be anything, Freddie. It could be Man. fucking life. could be training uh, horses. could be pussy. I don't give a fuck what it is. And seriously. I don't know, man. That's a good question. I mean, I I, I don't think I would necessarily change a lot of things I've done. Mm-hmm. But, but if I knew now what I didn't know at 21 years old, I... You're gonna find this kind of kind of stupid, but I, I would probably save more money. Yes, I like you know that. honestly because I mean I I won a lot, mm-hmm. you know, and I let a lot of money get through my fingertips yep. just just thinking that that this shit was gonna last forever. forever. The money tree was gonna yeah. go forever. I could actually say the same thing. I yeah. did well for myself, but I could have. I could have been flying in a G6 right now if I would have saved a little more. You get what I'm saying? I'm not going to tell that a lot. You, bego- you get what I'm saying? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, hell yeah. But, I mean, that's the only really the thing that I've done, you know, and, and like like when I was really rolling, mm. I mean, shit, I would charter a plane, no big deal. And if yeah. I had to go by myself, yeah. it was just, yeah. I just slap the old credit card out and, yeah. and hop on the plane and away you go. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's a, That's great advice, Fred. That that's the only thing that I think I would change throughout my career, and, and simply because I mean I've done everything that I set out to do. Mm-hmm. Did I dream I was going to have as much success as I had? I would not. I'd be a lying some bitch if I told you mm-hmm. yes. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and I just worked my ass off. I did it my way. I tried not to do people wrong throughout yep. my whole career. But I didn't take no shit either. No. You know what I mean? Winners I, don't take any shit, Fred. Yeah. I just stood on what I believed yep. in and. And, um, you know, throughout the whole process of, of being an eight-time world champion, and um, the the thing for me is, is did I set out to change the rodeo world? Fuck no, it just happened. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It, it, it happened to me because I set myself up, put myself in the right position. And Opportunity and hard work I, met each other. I would like to think that every championship that I got, mm-hmm. I won. Yeah. None of them son of a bitches were given to me by nobody. Mm-hmm. Agree. I had to get my black ass in the truck, drive up and down the road, <laughs> 100,000 miles, 60,000 miles, and earn them. You're damn right. And when all the chips fall, they fell my way. Yeah. Yes, but you you got to admit, you know, Ian Francis always says, luck is when hard work and opportunity meet each other. Damn right. There's no such thing as luck. It's when hard work and opportunity meet each other, yeah. that's when people think that's luck. Right. And every world championship you won wasn't luck. It was when you, your hard work and opportunity met each other. Yes. You're exactly right. Well, Fred, it, it's been a pleasure, mate. I, I've really enjoyed talking to you. I, I love that the podcast is helping people become better. Yeah. And they're telling me this. And I want people, I'm sure people will listen to your story and be inspired. And and as as people that want to mentor younger people in, in the Western performance industries, I think you're a great role model for people. You've done an excellent job. And there's been blo- roadblocks around and you just went over them. Yes. You didn't let them stop you. No. You went around them, over them, under them, but they sure as fuck didn't stop you. No. Yeah. Fred. At the time I went right through. Cheers. I love your attitude, brother. Today's episode was filmed and produced by Intercut Productions, marketing by Stuart and Associates, and organized and administrated by Down Under Horsemanship. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button and leave a rating. Follow us and stay up to date on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. See you next time, mate. Cheers.